thank you, everybody, for giving me the kind of honour and privilege to be able to share some of my thoughts. Um, I think as somebody, if those of you have heard me speak before or read some of my work, you'll know that I always tend to be a bit awkward, a bit kind of pickly and tend to go against the grain. And that's not because, you know, I kind of, um, uh, it's a hobby that I do, but I, I can sometimes feel it's good to just push against uh, the kind of received wisdom or uh, the kind of orthodoxy, just in order for us to think, think, think through what it is that we're doing. So really, this presentation is partly about all of us to try and us to think about what is it when we, you know, calling for decolonization of higher education or education, what does it actually mean? Uh, but also to, you know, identify some of the kind of maybe problems and contradictions. So I have written a paper. I've dropped uh, the link, a link into the chat. It's only it's work in progress, and I'm very happy for people to comment and to uh, give feedback. Um, and you've got my email at Warwick on on the paper, so anybody can email me. So I'm going to kind of go through this paper. It's very old old pedagogy here. So do excuse me. I'm, I think you're all we're all sick and tired of PowerPoint presentations and things. So it almost feels like refreshing to go back to a, you know, somebody who's going to actually give a paper. So if you feel that this is going backwards, and I apologize for that, but um, uh, let's see where we get. Yeah. So despite resistance from right wing media and states across the Western world, academic institutions have seemingly been embracing the idea of decolonization in recent years. And the demand for the decolonization of the university incorporates calls for a more diverse and inclusive curriculum, increased representation of racially minoritized staff in the academy, and the decentering of Eurocentric and colonial foundations of academic knowledge production. I'm sure you all recognize this. Uh, though decolonization is seemingly motivated by a desire to promote equity and social justice uh, and address historical injustices. In this presentation, I can argue that there are three significant flaws in the way that the project has really unfolded or conceived and implemented within the academy. These are first that there's a poor understanding of the very forms of oppression, exploitation and injustice that anti-colonial movements sought to confront. Secondly, that the contradictory nature of the modern neoliberal university and its role in neocolonialism lends one to think, do we really trust these institutions to deliver on this? And third, there's a failure of institutions to break free from the very systems of classification of human beings that were established to rationalize a colonial project in the first place. And some of you will have heard some of my work on the whole problem of classification in other places. So in this paper, I'm not going to uh, try to offer you a list of prescriptions on, on as to how to do decolonial work within the university. And I don't, uh, and I'm not here to criticize the efforts of so many dedicated individuals. Um, I'm just trying to put this into a wider and a historical context. And I'm sure that in this lecture theory is, you know, some of that kind of more concrete kind of you know, classroom based work, if you like, will be explored. But I think just on a personal note, I've having been active in the field of anti-racist politics for about 45 years or so now and seeing firsthand how the state and its institutions have sought first to capture the challenges that have come to, for the state, you know, and uh, anti-racism isn't new. But then it's, you know, it's reconfigured those ongoing historical struggles for justice and turned them into something else. And I suppose my aim is to set the rocket record straight and remind ourselves of what it was that our forefathers were struggling for and against when they were fighting for liberation and freedom from colonial imperial empires and to remain true to those aspirations. So it's really important that we link the present to the past, though history remains an imperfect enterprise for a whole set of reasons, not least because, you know, it's often his story, his white man's story. It's also the case that the only way to understand the present is through developing a historical perspective. And as James Baldwin notes, and I quote, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise since it is the history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities and our aspirations. Though anti-colonial struggles have had been going on for centuries, most significantly it is after the French Revolution and the American revolutions at the end of the 18th century that we see European colonizers beginning to be evicted from colonized lands. In 1804, Haiti, uh, which was called San Domingo, declared its independence from France. 
In 1821, Mexico achieved its independence from Spain. The following year, Brazil won its independence from Portugal. And by the 1820s, most of the mainland Americas uh, had achieved their independence from European colonial powers. Now, except for Haiti, the rest of the Caribbean colonies would have to wait until the 20th century for their colonial independence. And if we look at the other major regions of uh, European colonization, namely Africa and Asia, including the Middle East, most gained independence just in the last 70 years, which in terms of human history is not a long time. And many commentators argue that the only reason the European colonialists allowed independence was because of the ravages of the Second World War, which I call the European Tribal War. And following the war, we saw the emergence of a Cold War with new configurations of the so-called capitalist West and the communist Eastern Bloc. And the newly free ex-colonies were, were keen to preserve the peace and political self-representation determination that they had long struggled for, held a very important meeting and on, on the 18th, it started on the 18th of April to the 24th in 1955 in, a, in Indonesia, a town called Bandung, and this is known as the Bandung Conference. Um, now, delegates from this newly independent and African countries met to affirm their desire for independence and their refusal to align with the world powers, which they saw as implicit in the kind of imperial project. They were united in their opposition to colonialism and urged countries still under colonial rule to fight for independence. They demanded the decolonization and, and emancipation of peoples of Africa and Asia, peaceful coexistence and economic development, non-interference in internal affairs. And the Bandung Conference also laid the groundwork for the non-aligned movement. And therefore it marked the emergence of so-called third world countries on, their, on the international stage on their own terms. So this barely gets a mention in contemporary conversations about decolonizing the university. It's only, it's only as if this recent history has no relevance to the conversation that we're having. If colonialism in its broadest sense is understood as a historical process, where a group of people over time by various means incorporate adjacent territory and settle its people on newly conquered territory, then one must accept this is not a new phenomena. Indeed, a cursory scan of world history highlights numerous examples of such acts of dominance and subjugation, which lends good credence to the suggestion that colonialism and the human condition may be intimate, intimately linked. However, when we look at world history from the 16th century and the ascendancy of mercantile global capitalism, turbocharged by unprecedented technological developments in navigation and warfare uh, and industrialization later on, a very de decisive and unique form of coloniality emerged to prof profoundly shape the world as we see, know it and see it today. The world as we've experienced it today is the world that's been shaped by this, this period of colonialization. Colonialism in the modern sense began with what Western historians have euphemistically termed the age of discovery and the Portuguese conquest of the port city of uh, Sueta in North, on the northern shore of Africa in 1415. Far from being concerned with some benevolent desire to explore the world, as we're often told, this moment represents the commencement of a political project leading to the involuntary and unprecedented displacement, political domination and genocide of large numbers of people across the world. The results of this global upheaval that lasted into the mid 20th century and in, in, in its neo-colonial form still is there today, was to shape the world of nations and economic structures to the point where it almost is inconceivable to imagine a different world. In short, colon colonialism became woven into the very fabric of the modern world today. It's everywhere. However, through a process of deliberate erasure and selective amnesia, we forget that millions of people in the continents of Africa, Asia and Latin America fought for centuries against the imposition of colonial rule. But rather than be celebrated as great liberationists, they were portrayed as dangerous, anarchists, terrorists, disloyal, disturbed fanatics. For example, though she changed, changed her tone subsequently, the then British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher famously described Nelson Mandela as a terrorist during his imprisonment in the 1980s in Robin Island prison. 
In an 80, 1987 interview with Temp Television, she said, and I quote, the ANC is a typical terrorist organization. Anyone who thinks it is going to run the government in South Africa is living in cloud cuckoo land. End of quote. In the period following the Second World War, then, we see the project of decolonization gaining international legal force. In 1960, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution on decolonization that captures the spirit of the times by noting that, and I quote, the process of liberation is irresistible and irreversible. But at the same time, in this period after the World War II, it was apparent that the imperialist powers did not want to permit the formerly colonized peoples to establish national sovereignty and various processes of human dignity. The imperialists fought a hybrid war against these new nations, including through coups and assassinations, through economic blockades and sanctions, as well as through an, inf uh, an information and culture war that diminished the confidence of the peoples of these new states. So whilst people who demand decolonization are accused of being woke or involved in culture wars, it's actually the colonialists that were involved in, in fact, colonization was a culture war amongst other things. In 1965, a year before he was removed in a coup, Ghana's president Kwame Nkrumah wrote a powerful book called Neocolonialism, in which he described the neocolonial structures of the post-colonial period. These structures, he argued, included the maintenance of the old economic colonial patterns, impoverishment of the new states, reliance upon external, largely Western financing, permanent debt crisis, and dependency on the former colonial powers for their destiny. The fight by the Northern Line movement, which was established in 1961, was to overturn this neo-colonial structure, and the fight remains alive and well today. So if we think about anti-colonialism and post-colonialism, this other kind of di uh, discussion that's in the literature, around the 1970s against the backdrop of anti-colonial movements that emerged, as I said, in the early 20th century, we saw the emergence of non-European scholarship that sought to make sense of coloniality and colonialism from what we might term a black or a subaltern perspective, or a non-white perspective, non-European perspective, if you like. The likes of Franz Fanon, Edward Said, Chenichu Achebe, Achille Ambebi, Nadine Godima, Ajez Ahmed, Gautri Spivak, and Homi Baba became marked as post-colonial writers, giving rise to courses, research centers, and academic publications and journals with post-colonial studies in the title. Now, whilst this work has been critical in developing and expanding the literature on post-coloniality, according to people like Vivek Chiba, by shifting attention away from the materialist analysis of the relationship between capital and colonial oppression and focusing the study on post-coloniality, it actually at best obscured and at worst displaced attention on the actual and ongoing anti-colonial struggles. The effect of this was, Chibber argues, in its way it came an abiding interest in culture and ideology, not merely as an object of study, but as an explanatory principle that rapidly usurped the same exalted place that class or capitalism had. So Chibber's most damning critique of post-colonial theorists is his suggestion that by conflating two distinct projects, namely the historic, historiographic project of subaltern studies, which was concerned with uncovering how cultural imperialism functions, to socially, politically and geographically excluded from the hierarchy of power with post-colonial theory, would end up distorting the history of each as well as the institutional relationships between them. He also suggests that by relativizing universal categories such as capitalism, class, liberalism, rationality and objectivity, post-colonial theory exposed itself to the very critiques of oriental notions of the global south, namely by presenting a highly exoticized and essentialized understanding of it, of the west as fundamentally different from others incapable of being understood by Western categories, its people untouched by reason and rationality. So is this seeming rejection of the possibility of universalism on the one hand, and the valorization of cultural relativism that lies at the core of the critique of post-colonial studies. Now for people like Chiba, the argument for post-colonial studies are based on a series of analytical and historical misunderstandings. 
And that contrary to post-colonial currents, universalism is possible without succumbing to Eurocentrism. And that's an argument that I will develop later on. The second criticism in following the trend set down by French post-structuralists such as Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault, the relegation of political economy in favour of an emphasis on culture and discourse. It is this trend towards what, in his more general critique of the postmodern turn, uh, the Sri Lankan Marxist writer Ambulavia Sivanandan characterised as a retreat from the world into the word. Now, in a similar vein, Eve Tuck and Wayne Young, in a paper that they published in 2012 entitled Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, expressed concerns about a trend towards a kind of performative, palliative decolonization where academic institutions were simply displacing early approaches to equality, diversity, and social justice with superficial references to decolonization, which, and I quote, renders decolonization as a conveniently empty signifier. As they argue, decolonization, which we assert is a distinct project from other civil and human rights based social justice projects, is far too often subsumed into the directive of these projects with no regard for how decolonization wants something different than May those forms of social it, justice. Uh, uh, the so decolonization as a metaphor, they suggest, allows people to fudge contrary decolonial between what they term external and internal colonialism. Yeah, I think somebody's got their mic on. If they could just shut the mic off, please. So thank you. Yeah. So I've lost my track. Yeah, so decolonization as a metaphor, they suggest, allows people to fudge contradictory decolonial desires between what they term external and internal colonialism. External colonialism is, and I quote, the ongoing exploitation of fragments of indigenous worlds, animals, plants, and human beings. Let me just repeat that. External colonialism is the ongoing exploitation. It's a material physical process of fragments of indigenous worlds, animals, plants and human beings, extracting them to transport them and build the wealth, the privilege or feed the appetites of the colonizers. An internal colo colonialism is the management and exploitation of people, land, flora, fauna within domestic borders of the imperial nation, which invariably involves uh, the use of particularized modes of control, prisons, ghettos, monetarizing, schooling, policing to ensure the ascendancy of a nation and its white elite. So they're drawing attention to these kind of mechanisms that are here now alive and well, but rarely do, does the dis discussions around decolonization within the university even mention these things around control and surveillance. The key point here is that co colonialism needs to be understood as an evolving system and set of technologies that are rooted in the material exploitation of people, land and animals, and not simply a word that may offer post-colonial studies academics any number of opportunities to exercise their ability to construct increasingly exclusive and obscure academic papers that very few people will read outside of academia. So if we focus much more on the kind of project of decolonizing the university, though there is a long history of anti-colonial and anti-slave writings, overall white supremacy for a complex set of reasons, managed to maintain its stranglehold on academia. <clears throat> for sure, we had important movements in North America with the emergence of black universities, beginning with Howard University in the latter part of the 19th century. But arguably in Europe, Asia, Africa and the Caribbean, on the whole whiteness, either in terms of the faculty makeup and or the taught curriculum, remained firmly rooted in the white supremacist mindsets. Contrary to contemporary views about universities outside the so-called civilized West, there is evidence of institutions of higher learning focusing on a range of subjects, including philosophy, medicine, astronomy, and mathematics before 500 BC, across what has been described, as I said, despising as the third world. However, because of European imperialism, universities across the world became modeled, certainly contemporary universities, on the Western uh, approach, Western model which goes back to the ancient universities that emerged in the first part of the second millennium. Now, most significantly is within the commencement of the European colonial project from the 16th century, 
that Western universities become co-opted into the imperial project in ways that reflected the nature of the relationship between the colonized lands and the mother country. In other words, a lot of those, you know, traditional universities, because the new universities weren't around, although I'm going to argue that they're being co-opted into this project in new and sophisticated ways, those traditional ones, you know, your Oxbridges, your Harvards, the Ivy Leagues, they were they were they were instrumental in enabling the colonial project to happen. While the French, Belgium, German and Portuguese power exercised direct rule and a higher, highly centralized type of administration, the British sought to rule by identifying local power brokers and encouraging or forcing these administ to administer for the British Empire. Hence, whilst the British deployed colonial higher education to establish a local elite of colonial administrators, the French and the Portuguese used higher education to implement their direct rule and assimilationist policies. And as a result, very few universities were created and elite Africans were educated largely in European institutions, certainly in the, in the French and Portuguese context. This, of course, is one side of the story. There is evidence that from the 19th century against the backdrop of intense conflicts between church and state and between European colonial powers resulting in, for example, the US Civil War between 1761 to 5 and the French Revolution of 1799, the, the traditional role of university was, universities was also being questioned. In fact, there was turmoil taking place in the universities. In this context, radicalized professors and students made significant contributions to the creation of and participation in national liberation movements. So in that sense, you know, decolonizing the university, if it's a project of professors and scholars engaging in these kind of things is taking place, you know, 150, 200 years ago. It's not new. And, you know, the, the kind of the, the ruptures within Europe, the political, economic and social ruptures within what might be seen as a kind of late enlightenment also reflects some of these turmoils. So although the university has been an instrument of colonialism, we can't deny that. In many cases, it has also served as a site of contestation organization and struggle for national liberation that unfolded throughout the 20th century. However, the most intense direct call for the decolonization of the university comes in the context of the collapse of apartheid in South Africa and the, uh, and, and the emergence in 1994 of Nelson Mandela and, 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 and the new government. Uh, one of the regime's first tasks was to develop policies uh, to correct the damage of apartheid in the realms of education. And the most noteworthy of these was the Higher Education Act uh, 101 and the National Plan for Higher Education, which was promising change. However, progress proved to be painfully slow, which led to widespread student protests. And in 2015, uh, there was a movement demanding the decolonization of South African universities. And as Jensen in his book, Decolonization in University, the Politics of Knowledge Notes, and I quote from his book, which was published in 2019, the student protest started starting in 2015, added a new term to the lexicon uh, of South African universities, decolonization. It is, of course, a word with a long history dating back to the anti-colonial struggles of the 1950s and extended to the post-colonial period to signal ongoing efforts to undo the legacies of colonialism. But decolonization had never been a prominent or sustained component of the struggle discourse under the uh, uh, under or after apartheid, the discursive terminologies of the struggle included terms like anti-apartheid education, liberation pedagogy, reconstruction and redevelopment education, and of course, the ub ubiquitous reference transformation. So he's saying that the, the, the real, again, the political struggle of decolonization was not reflected in the curriculum that was being developed. In terms of the UK, by and large, the university sector with its self-perception of being world leading persuaded itself that if there was a problem relating to race and racism, then it, this belongs somewhere else, but not amongst the scholarly community, which because of its so-called superior capacities for rationality was largely free from such prejudices. However, the Roads Must Fall protest movement that began on the 9th of March 2015, which originally you know, was directed towards a statue at the University of Cape Town quickly spread to other campuses in South Africa and then to Oxford University as well. And the rest of the UK, this led to other movements such as Why is My Professor Not Black, especially in the context of the widely diverse student body. 
though historically decolonization was always linked to very concrete material concerns, as I've argued earlier on, linked to ownership of land, property, as well as respect for cultural and linguistic traditions. In relation to the university, it appears to have morphed into a battle over words, representation and culture wars. This is not to argue that the cultural domain is not important, it certainly is, but to observe a greater, the greater emphasis on the struggle over culture appears to have conceded with a lack of attention to the bigger historical struggles against the physical and economic violence of colonialism that continues to shape the lives of people even today. And uh, both in the former colonies and in the in the diaspora, if you like, in the motherland. And Fan Fanon in, in his book, The Wretched of the Earth State, it cannot be understood, it cannot become intelligible nor clear to itself, except in the exact measure that we can discern the movements which gave it historical form and content. Let us admit it, the settler knows perfectly well that no phraseology can be a substitute for reality. So what Fan is saying is that. We need to focus on the realities of coloniality and not be too obsessed with the kind of words or the representations of it. Now, worse still, through attempts to highlight how brutal and psychologically destructive colonial regimes of power and control and violence were, which is true, some of the debate has taken a woodingly turn towards the construction of black victimology that runs the danger of rationalised black cultural pathology. In other words, overly focusing on the undeniable horrors of colonialism and racism runs the danger of diminishing resistance, creativity and resilience, or even entertain the possibility of it uh, by suggesting that it was such a brutal enterprise that it almost expunged black agency. And this is a, some, uh, something that Oli Fomitaiwo in his book, recent book, Against Decolonization, he puts this argument. So this mainstreaming of decolonization has raised concern about its political neutralization particularly in the UK, as universities try to address student demands, whilst also not antagonising a political landscape, which is hostile to critiques of British Britain's imperial history. I mean, we know what's happening at the moment with the Tories, attacks left, right and centre on any progressive criticism of British history. And in this context, authors such as Olafemi Tewu and Leon Mousavi have criticised the what they call the decolonisation industry, and the bandwagon of intellectual decolonization as a limited performance of morality and authenticity. So if one looks at the current trend of universities committing themselves sometimes publicly to decolonize, one is led to believe that this is synonymous with other policies such as those oriented towards diversity and inclusion, and often these can kind of get bundled together. Whilst nobody would argue against such policies, it's important to realize that each is built around a very specific political and ideological concern, which on closer examination may appear to be contradictory. In a similar vein to the calls for defunding the police following the murder of George Floyd, it is for this reason that Mousavi speculates whether a better alternative to decolonizing universities is to abolish them altogether. Though not advocating the dismantling of university in their widely cited book, The Undercommons Fugitive Planning and Black Study, Harney and Morton argue that in its present form, the university serves to maintain existing power structures and to reproduce social hierarchies, and that the short term task of decolonizing is to confront the system through direct actions with the ultimate goal of being a radical restructuring of the university system and a re recognition of the knowledge and expertise of hitherto marginalized communities. As I was saying in his book Against Decolonization, Taking African Agency Seriously, Olofemu Tewu provokes us to completely rethink the way that the decolonial project within academia has been constructed and conceived. He argues that decolonization reduced to a wholly cultural or philosophical project has lost its way. For him, decolonization is more accurately anti-colonialism uh, and was primarily a struggle to escape the West's direct political and economic control. But it has now become a catch-all idea for performing morality and authenticity. He fiercely rejects the lazy application of decolonization to everything that what he terms, as I said, the decolonizing industry. And he suggests that much of the current discourse on, of decolonization is un, unhelpful as it is both very US centered and tends to be restricted to the realms of culture. Taken together, he suggests that 
there are two flaws in this project uh, as it has become institutionalized. First, he argues by overly abstracting it from the historical and most critically material dimensions of colonial exploitation, which continues to this day, it becomes uh, uh, it becomes apolitical. Uh, and second, the kinds of ubiquitous nebulous decolonial talk ends up further victimizing Africans. He's not dismissing the immense violence of colonialism, both physical and psychological. And, you know, people like Francis, Franz Fanon, W.D. Du Bois, C.L.R. James, Bill, James Baldwin, and others have discussed this at le length in their writing. But he is also very wary of not allowing this to imply that Africans or Africa or all colonized people, for that matter, became completely defeated. This is the key thing. And, and thus lost any sense of their own agency. In this regard, he's keen to remind us of what he calls two colonialisms. One being political economic dominance, the other being cultural and ideological dominance. And he argues that because these colonized societies were very diverse before Western colonialism, the simplistic suggests the anti-colonial struggles were in part seeking to reclaim or rescue some kind of national culture. Because often those, those national cultures themselves were framed around those very labels and descriptions and those entities that were constructed in the colonial project. And a good example of that would be now, you know, with, say, in India, with uh, Modi and uh, the, the, his BJP, Hindu, Hindu Dutra nationalism. The, I mean, the problem is India didn't exist before before the British came. It was lots of different kind of countries. Yet we're now trying to decolonize India by constructing an alternative Indian nationalism. In doing so, what, what, uh, what he argues is that... Um, we need scholars who are working in this field of decolonization need to be much more robust in the ways they ask, they approach their task and to avoid conflating colonialisms with everything. Another problem with what one might term performative decolonization or decolonialism is that it tends to restrict its critique or at least activism to the celebration of non-white European cultural production, which very much follows on from some of the multiculturalist policies that have characterized the UK's response to race relations in more recent years. Uh, this approach is perfectly captured in the establishment of Black History Month uh, in October. Uh, and now we have South Asian History Month in January. And now what these celebrations do is two things. First, for one month in a year, they create the equivalent of, I, I say, visits to the zoo to see exotic anim animals behind cages. It reduces black people and history to a set of performances to provide the white masters with a spectacle. In truth, white colonialists have always been keen to study and to consume and to observe non-white cultures. We only need to look at the explosion of world food or black music to see this. And secondly, the, the reduced coloniality is some defect or aberration in the relentless march of European enlightenment towards modernity. And Walter Miganolo has described coloniality as the reverse and unavoidable side of modernity. It's darker side, like for the, the dark side of the moon. We do not see when we observe it from the earth. It follows that whilst one may have achieved some kind of political uh, settlement through independence, the task of decolonization runs much deeper. And in fact, modernity itself or the kind of societies and the systems are, in, are interrelated with colonialism. So you know, one can't, you can't get rid of one without getting rid of the other. In this sense, one must stop, stop, stop constructing the decolonial project of returning to some kind of pre-colonial state or reclaiming indigenous traditions as if those traditions themselves are not moving and changing and, and you know, developing. Much more important is the question of addressing the terrible damage and injustice that has been caused to the people and the planet. And in this sense, anti-colonialism must be seen through the lens of economic and social justice, as well as much as it's to do with uh, culture and representation. And that means the issue of reparations. And I just want to finish my talk by focusing a bit on this question. Today, former colonial powers who have built their entire economic success off the back of colonialism and slavery have refused to consider reparations and have opted for the paternalistic and highly problematic model of aid to the developing and third world nations, almost entirely those that were colonized. 
We've also seen some high profile Ivy League universities gesturing towards this. So and I'll mention Harvard later on, who has done probably more, more than most. But Glasgow and Bristol have been doing things. They've published reports, established scholarships and research centres. This is a, you know, it's a forward step, but very little else, let alone reparation. The statue of Sir Cecil Rhodes at Oriel College at Oxford still remains. But the call for reparation goes back to the end of slavery in the US. For example, the 19th century American social reformer abolitionist writer Frederick Douglass, back in the uh, latter part of the 1800s, was talking about reparations soon after the 13th Amendment of the US, US Constitution that abolished slavery in 1865. So, you know, but but somehow th this this challenge, this question of reparations doesn't seem to apply when it comes to colonialism. Now, I don't want people to make me think that I'm trying to make a model equivalence here, but if we contrast this to the aftermath of the Nazi Holocaust and Germany's post-war reparations program, writing in the New York Times, Melissa Eddy notes that reparations, and I quote, became such a matter of fact that many Germans are not even aware that their country, after paying $89 billion in compensation, mostly to Jewish victims of Nazi war crimes, over six de decades still meets regularly to revise and expand the guidelines for qualification. And the other irony is that reparations were paid to the slave owners after, after the abolishment of slavery. Uh, and we were all paying those reparations until a few years ago. So I just, I'm, I, there's a whole section in the paper around uh, identity politics that I don't really want to, uh, I don't want to kind of get into that because that, that in a sense will take quite a lot of time, but I'm just going to now come to, come to a conclusion and then we can open up the conversation, yeah? So the fight against direct white European imperial domination in many parts of the world was won in the 20th century, yeah? They were kicked out. Oh, the consequences and impacts of colonialism persist and in the 21st century are visible both in significant disparities in wealth, health and education between the global north and the global south. And you know that in development literature, there's all that data there. These effects are also experienced by those people of non-white European descent, typically identified as black and Asian minorities or people of culture, or who for a complex range of push and pull factors find themselves living and struggling against ongoing and increasing subtle forms of racial oppression and violence in the colonial motherland. And the, you know, if you think about the refugee crisis, the kind of whole issue, these are all intimately linked to post-colonial nations that, that are in turmoil for a whole set of reasons, uh, but primarily in the way in which those nations were, the development of those peoples was you know deeply deeply impacted by european colonialism however the collapse of the left during the second half of the 20th century and the diminution of aspirations for alternatives to capitalism you know this kind of fukuyama's end of history and the kind of and and and, and the triumph of neoliberal capitalism and an altogether more humane and equitable system based on socialism all these things uh, in a sense were lost resulted in a dilution of the meaning of radicalism and decolonization. And the co-option of some of these struggles into the logics of neoliberalism. Uh, there are many reasons for this, but perhaps more significantly, the loss of social movements that once gave uh, these struggles uh, a real kind of you know street presence uh, seem to have diminished. Today, anti-colonial struggles on campuses are less driven by student activism than by centralized human resources and academic development services. It's become an organizational imperative rather than a political imperative. Now, that there's nothing wrong with that at one level, but once it becomes an organizational imperative, then it, in a sense, becomes redefined as, as, a, as a project that is something different. Decolonization is a serious but complex issue. And coloniality is not just about the past, but also how the past bears upon the present and also what we imagine about the future. And in this regard, decolonization must be seen as a future oriented project. And Franz Fanon, arguably the most influential scholar of coloniality talked about building, a, and I quote, a new history of man that advanced a different set of universal values. In his view, anti-colonial nationalism, the political freedom were only the first step towards a new world. 
to a new conception of being human that avoided the, and again he goes, the great white error of racial superiority. As we see regressive forces in the former colonized countries deploying the same kind of racialized rhetoric against minorities by claiming that this was an extension of the process of decolonization, one must question the danger of a particularly regressive form of politics of difference, which has to some extent displays previous anti-racist and anti-colonial anti politics. The ease with which enlightenment has been dismissed in the name of decolonization is more a reflection of the current state of contemporary radicalism than a critique of the European, of the Enlightenment ideal itself. For sure, many of the Enlightenment scholars help deeply racist, problematic views about colonized people. And for sure, some of their theories sought, if not to justify racism, to provide some kind of rational explanation for it. However, this is only part of the story. And the challenge is to reinvigorate the lofty ideals of the Enlightenment that inspired, and we have to accept it, anti-colonial movements. And with this, to develop a renewed sense of urgency and purpose in the face of ongoing struggles for justice. Uh, and uh, as for the practical challenge of decolonizing the university, which many universities are still flapping around, looking to identify what actions they can perform, others such as Harvard have done some very practical and concrete things with, the, for example, uh, the Presidential Committee on the Legacy of Slavery, which published a report last year, and you can read it on, on the web, in which Harvard committed 100 million pounds of reparations uh, and the report concludes, we believe that Harvard's intellectual, reputational and financial resources should be marshaled in its efforts to remedy the harms of the university's ties to slavery, just as past representatives of Harvard deployed these same resources and caused harm. So this is a kind of direct, uh, at least admission of its complicity in, in, in coloniality and in, in slavery. And I'm not sure that UK universities are really prepared to go that far. But sadly, rather than taking seriously the challenge of identifying and addressing their own legacies of colonialism, slavery and racism, and focusing on reparations, arguably many UK universities through internationalization policies, both home and abroad, are involved in neo-colonialism. And in this regard, what we perhaps need to do is to develop a more expansive notion of enlightenment, of freedom and reason, one that is rooted in an honest admission that the enlightenment of the past 400 years has only benefited a small number of human beings, and this at the expense of the more of most human beings of nature and the planet's ecosystems. Today, in our institutions of higher education, where racism is still rife, where bias is woven into the very pedagogic fabric, and where nepotism and white supremacy is embedded, arguably what we need uh, is more, not less reason. We need more and not less rationality, and we need to hold up. The, the ideals of rationality and reason to these uh, colonial uh, educated, colonial imperialists and co colonial administrators say, you the, were the ones that failed on your rationality and on your reason. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Um, there was a lot of food for thought there. Um... What did I guess? <laughs> Um, things that I guess colleagues may have thought about and interacted with before, and I hope um, things that colleagues haven't thought about or interacted with before. So I'm going to, uh, okay, so there's a question from Martin in the chat. So it's he's asking, hasn't the decolonial term in HE had the positive effect of reigniting the conversation and starting some basic pre-decolonial work? Lazily and hastily called decolonial at its best, it's about delivering a small amount of epistemic justice, and at its worst, it's high. At its worst, sorry, it's hijacking and incorporated into EDI. Well, I, I think kind of he answered the, his own question. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think Martin's right. Um, anything we do is good. I mean, I'm, I'm, my argument isn't that we shouldn't be doing things. I suppose when that's abstracted from the bigger historical picture then it runs a danger that it becomes performative, yeah? And that's what I mean. It becomes a kind of a, it's a way of, of avoiding criticism, especially for universities. You know, an example I'll give is just, just at the end, I talked about internationalization. Now, if, if you know, we can either see internationalization is wonderful kind of reaching out and, you know, kind of creating this wonderful melting pots and things. But, you know, if you start to dig down and the, look at the experience of international students, you look at the reasons why they are, why they are coming, you'll find, 
they're deeply, deeply, and, and the way in which they're exploited, they're deeply connected to the colonial kind of mechanisms of the past. You know, that's my point. You know, and, and Coventry University, my former university, is probably the biggest culprit of that. You know, it's kind of giving British degrees outside all over the place now and saying you can be even, I don't know, what, 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 what's that about? And, and taking huge amounts of fees off them. Yeah, that was, I mean, this was my experience in the Caribbean as well. And sometimes we don't understand, um, or sometimes universities capital, a lot of times universities capitalise on the colonial mindset that still exists in post-colonial countries. Yeah. And a lot of us here don't see and understand, as you spoke about capitalism and the impact of money and economics and all this, don't understand how, as universities, these international partnerships and these relationships with other universities and campuses overseas yeah. are a form of neo-colonialism and it buys into that very colonial mentality that still exists out there. Um, yeah. So I mean, absolutely. I've, I've been to made a comment about the Black History Month and I raised that issue. And I mean, I, what I was suggesting there was that the kind of performative decolonialism is like visiting the zoo. And and then allowing people in power to go over and say, I've experienced otherness, I've engaged with these people, but actually it's behind bars. It, it's not, I, I say, if you really want to decolonize, you have to step into each other's ontological space. You have to get into the cage with the zoo animal, or better still, if you need to go out in the wild and live in the wild. Do you get what I'm saying? Otherwise, it is just going to the zoo. It's like foreign holidays. It's like, you know, going, having trips abroad. Uh, and I'm not saying that all Black History Month events are like that. I think they can be varied, but I was making a more general argument. I'm suggesting, why do we have Black History Month? Why shouldn't it be every month be Black History? You know? Absolutely. And now we've got South Asian History Month, and it's almost like people are competing with each other. And that's another colonial strategy. Get these kind of post-colonial people to fight with each other for entitlement. Really? Um, Amrit asked a question that I was I was mulling over in my own mind as well, just thinking about the radicalized the radicalism of decoloniality and power. So she said, I mean, sorry, they've said I find it difficult to understand how we get any meaningful movement on decolonization and anti-colonialism if colonizers aren't able to accept and admit their role in coloniality and neocolonization. Such historical amnesia is a huge barricade to any objective process. How do we change this if we can? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I think you're right. You're kind of in a, echoing my own kind of concerns. I think ultimately we have to understand universities. I mean, I did re recognize and acknowledge that within the Western universities, particularly in the kind of when the upheavals were taking place around the kind of, you know, the, the, the French Revolution and around that period, that scholarship and activism, I mean, France is famous for its kind of activism within the university. So I think those political movements were there and they you can't dismiss them as not being significant, you know, socialist movements. But my argument is that that's kind of all died off now. In fact, all you have is kind of consumers protesting now. It's, it's almost as if, uh, so, so in the absence of that, maybe all we can do is what we do in our classrooms. I'm not saying that we should stop doing that, but we have to connect to what's in the classroom, to what's happening outside and not much is happening outside. That's my concern. Or maybe we don't recognise that. Yeah, I think uh, my own thinking on it was um, particularly around power in the higher education organisation. We spoke about the fact that, um, you know, we know that higher education is essentially run and dominated and decision making is by white people. And we've spoken about how white supremacy mm -hmm. has been embedded into the entire fabric of higher education as it is. And so the few people of colour, the few people who are knowledgeable um, about decolonizing, anti-colonialism, anti-racism, who are in senior positions like myself, how do we be radical about this without losing the power that we have, the little bit of power that we have, um, in an attempt to make sure that we're still in a position to help? Because, you know, people like me, for example, if I move from my position, I know that there are some things that just won't be considered or discussed in certain spaces because I'm the only one who brings it up. So how do we how do we engage with this radical decolonizing while trying to tread the line of we don't want to completely move away from these spaces of power because we're the only ones who speak truth to power in those spaces? Uh, you know, I, I think for me, one of the criticisms of the of, of the ancient universities, yeah, you know, we go back hundreds of years, was this separation between town and gown. And in fact, if you look at the architecture of Oxford colleges, they were built as little fortresses with, with a kind of courtyard on the inside and big gates. 
because the townsfolks were attacking the the, the, the scholars, and and but the scholars felt that they, you know, the problems of the world could be solved by philosophizing, by kind of as it were withdrawing from the world, a bit like kind of yogis might in India, that somehow, in, you know, emancipation and liberation is through some kind of meditation. We we should meditate in universities, but we shouldn't just meditate in universities. We should get out and connect with the world out there as well, yeah? So that's my kind of argument. That kind of, I think, picks up what Martin Ruddock said. He said, you know, that you know, we are struggling with every epistemic, you know, justice and violence. And the university, maybe that's the business of universities is to is to struggle around epistemic justice. Yeah. So I'm I'm not diminishing that, but you know, unless that epistemic justice is somehow connected to the kind of injustices that are taking place outside, then it just becomes a kind of a meditation exercise. That's my argument. And 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 as I was saying, there's plenty of texts and books on on post-colonialism and on some of that writing I, I I don't understand it and I'm not sure for what purpose it's written you know but clearly it gives somebody titles it gives somebody a career and they get called to speak at conferences I suppose I do but I don't do it because of those reasons Fair enough. which is um, partly why I've given up on academic writing as well in the, in the sense that I'm not I'm not living to publish in peer-reviewed journals I'll write stuff but I'm writing it because of my activism. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, and yeah. that was an interesting part of the conversation we had last year around the limitations for academics in UK higher education. Um, we've got Amrit with a hand raised. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, that was really interesting. Uh, and I've been actually a fan following you on LinkedIn for a while. Uh, my research is on uh, social justice and lip service within organizations. So I, my day job is a management consultant in a large consulting firm, but my academic research is focusing on the experience, the lived experiences of minority ethnic groups who externalize their articles of faith, um, specifically uh, six. So listening to this and then kind of connecting how this practically happens in the world, um, I'm not in higher education as, as a job. But I find that corporations, especially, especially from the diversity and inclusion or equality, if you want to add that to it as well, angle, it's almost very, it's cursory. There's a lot of uh, lip service involved uh, where it's uh, controls based or compliance based mm -hmm. where they have to have, you know, a person of color in their board, for example, the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority has uh, mandated that um, and you know that it, it's also uh, being seen as a compliance exercise to succession planning um, but the actual root cause seems to be untouched and the whole context around um, imperialism col colonialization even within a workplace um, isn't is ignored almost and I find that really it's it's almost like a slap in the face. I mean, I'm you've kind of you know you've you've said what needs to be said. I think I think the question is whether again that that the, the Martin and Harney's work uh, around whether universities can be reformed, whether these institutions can be reformed. Yeah, and if you remember, I mentioned when George Floyd was killed, uh, and 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 the argument was whether the police could be reformed. Yeah, in the particularly in the South, because if you remember the Police in, in 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 the southern states of the United States, their origins were slave catchers. That's what they were. They were you know the, they were close to the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and, and and you know we have this romantic view of the British police as being Dixon and Doc Green. It's not actually it, you know the British police, if you look at its colonial form, was brutal. You know I mean, committed genocides. So I think what we have to understand, Amri, is that these. The, the the rationale in which these institutions, these big powerful institutions of government, but also I would say business, is still rooted in that colonial kind of you know mindset, uh, and and I'm not sure we're going to be able to overthrow that, but we need to understand it at least because what that helps us to do is to realise why those blocks are there, why are those patterns repeated, and and why that they can bring in you know black brown and black people onto the front bench of the Conservative Party, and still carry out some of the most violent colonial racist acts yeah because that's precisely what they did in the colonial period they use education to educate inverted commas 
the elites from those societies and then use them against the train the you know police forces i mean the british ruled india through co-option through you know militarizing that's why the sikhs have a kind of com confusing relationship with the british because on the one hand they were they were like a military arm of the british state both in in you know singapore malaysia places like that and and fighting the wars uh, so do we do we glorify that period or do we say this is a really dark period? It's a complex issue, Amrit, and but you've raised a really important uh, question. Um, Natty Holder's uh, asked a question. Yeah, what Professor, do you yeah. Professor Nate Holder. Yeah. Sorry, what do you Nate. think a university committed to decolonizing itself, if at all possible, might look like in five years from now? You see, this is a really interesting one. Uh, if I go back to what Franz Fanon said. He said that um, we've got to build a new man, a new human. We have to imagine. So I would say, I don't think I can imagine that because if I can decipher that, then I'm still trapped in the kind of mindset of the present, yeah? So so I'm, I'm not quite sure, uh, Ned, what you were thinking there because it's a creative project. It's It's a project of creativity. And I'm not I'm not sure what that would be. All I you know, and, and in, in that sense, what I would say, it has to be a co-created project. Yeah, properly co-created. Uh, it can't be a top down project. But I think a lot of the so-called co-creative activities today is still tokenistic. OK, okay. Um, we'll move on. Uh, a colleague, Sheila, has said that she shares the that they share the concern about how the invitation to decolonization has taken flight and has become very popular, but still doesn't get to the heart of eradicating systemic and structural um, mm. racist practice. How can we really call higher education organisations to account to increase equity and reduce inequalities? Well, it's the same kind of question. We have to keep fighting and keep struggling. I mean, I, I would say go back to um, imagine the struggles of our forefathers. Yeah, you know, I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, they, they were enslaved and imprisoned and everything else didn't stop them fighting and resisting. Uh, so we keep resisting. What we don't do is concede to the logics of the system. Yeah, because once you do that, then you you kill off all possibility of change. At least if you was it Fred Douglas said, you know, we have to have a demand. If you don't have a demand, power concedes nothing. Yeah. So we keep rising, you know, my Angela, we, we keep rising and we keep rising uh, and we keep hoping. And that's how we, uh, and, and history will, we, you know, history has this uncanny, key, uncanny moment where all that solid melts into air. I think that was Shakespeare and Marx. <laughs> um, Mushrat has spoken about the interplay between anti-capitalism, politics, economy and human rights. And the tension that they still have is that universities in the Western, in the West of the globe, take money from international students, particularly from IMF funded countries, and then universities to increase their funds by partnering with countries with bad hum poor human rights, sorry. And when they try to bring these topics up, they're shut down with the fact that the money that they get pays the salaries of university staff and so on. Yeah. I mean, again, I think that's, that's, a, that's a statement of fact, you know, I'm not sure there's anything that we can really add to that. Martin said, I wonder, has uh, colony, uh, ever decolonized itself? Let me give you a twist on this one, Martin. A few years ago, I interviewed Paul Gilroy. And some of you will be aware of Paul's work, yeah? Uh, it's not easy to pin him down, but I managed to get him up to Coventry and I interviewed him and asked him the question. I I, I talked, are you, you know, Audre Lorde's kind of um, yeah, famous quote that's often taken out of context, you know, the, will the, mas the master's house can never dismantle the master's. The master's tools can never dismantle the master. So I'm sure you've come across that. That's a bit like this, whether the master can dismantle it themselves. Yeah. What interestingly Paul Gilroy said, and this is an interesting, he said, perhaps only the master's tools can dismantle the master's house. And I think what he was saying was that the master claims themselves to be this great human, fair, you know, that our institutions do that. They have these mission steps. But well, let's hold them up to it then and say, are you fair? Are you are you rational? I mean, where's the rationality uh, in appointment, reappointing same kinds of white people and men at the top of these organisations? There's no rationality there. It's completely biased. 
and and that, you know if you represent rationality then you need to start addressing your lack of so let's use the very promises that they make and hold them to that yeah i think that's one way we can do that martin that and that way maybe the institution can uh, make some change but it has to then be honest about itself post humanist um, yes oh, Suzanne, is, Suzanne is asking um, do you think post-humanist theory can support understanding of decolonization so that it can be enacted rather than ticked? I'll tell you what, uh, Suzanne, I'm, I'm a bit fed up of post this and post that. I can remember when I uh, did my PhD at Warwick, I, it was going to be on postmodernism, And when I started reading that stuff, I found how vacuous it was. So, I, and I, that's why I think I'm now with the same thing with post-colonialism, you know. I feel it's so post. I, I, I mean, I, I just want to be human. Let's we'll become post once we've kind of and Fanon wants us to. We, so if post humanism is the new man, as Fanon was talking about, yeah, then let's bring it on. Um, I mean, I'd be interested to hear what you think. Uh, is this post human? I mean, people talk about technology and you know the kind of human and and so. I, and and, I, and I'm doing other work on AI. You know, AI is a white man. Artificial intelligence is a white man. You know, look at all the kind of all the material out there. So I think again, it's um, it's an interesting question, but I'm, I don't really have an answer to that one. Uh, I'd love you to come in, uh, Suzanne, and maybe answer your own question. Yeah, yes? um, I was yeah. just wondering uh, with posthumanist theory, um, it sort of supports a lot of movement that look at decentering the human so that it's rather a focus on the network of influences that co-construct um, onto epistemic processes. Mm -hmm. So rather than separation, it looks at connection. I was just thinking that if this if this was understood and enacted through curricula, um, then maybe staff would embody that change rather mm -hmm. than have a tick box instead. I mean, I, I think that's, you know, I think if that means being creative, then that's a good thing. I, let me come back to you and ask you whether you think everything to do with the Enlightenment was bad. I think it's difficult to put anything into good or bad categories because it sort of it's sort of another dualism. So I think that we okay. need to look at um, my, my, my work looks at um, phenomenology. So. Mm everything is much more of a connection and um, decolonizing is something that um, I'm interested in in doing more actively as a as yeah. a process to dismantle mm -hmm. um, social injustice yeah. um, where it, where it is and you know how, how it's perpetuated but only the only way to do that is to reflect on those processes yeah. and those interactions that have created it um, but we are part of that process so about looking at our, at what we do um, and how that's connected not only to other people mm -hmm. but like you mentioned the land uh, animals and yeah, uh, yeah. non-humans as well yeah no i get all that and i think there is a lot of important work on them um, on um, trying to move away from the kind of the hegelian dialectic yeah this idea that the only way that we can create any knowledge is through negation of knowledge is this kind of oppositionary binaries and I think what you're saying is that part of the way in which when we talk about co-creating knowledge is to, yeah. is to allow different yeah. ideas to sit side by side by side. Yeah, different yes, ontologies, diffract if you like. Yeah. Yes, diffractive practice that opens up um, mm -hmm. possibilities of new um, futures rather than yeah. enacting previous structures. Yeah. But do, are you, true, do, you, true. Do, do, you not, do you not think that there are these dangers of cultural relativism as well? That can be quite regressive. Yes, absolutely. I think yeah. that that's always going to be a uh, potential. But I think that um, by focusing on networks of processes that co-construct um, and fold in reality, no. we can better attend to those to change the structures that happen in the future. Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, I think you know, I'd love to explore that with you a bit more. Um, is anybody else? Yeah, we've got uh, Simon, whose hand has been up for a while. So thanks for your patience, yeah. Simon. I'll hi, come in sh oh, hi, hi, thank you very much. Going off, I heard you speak before, and so it's a really exciting, wonderful occasion. A very um, provocative, but also um, it sort of you know makes you think. Um, so th 
I mean, it's a number of things, really. I, mean, I was thinking about regarding the post-human, and I think it was Toni Morrison kind of answered, well, just as a work claiming our humanity, we're already announcing the end of humanity, and yeah. it, might be prem- it might be premature in some context to sort of embrace post-humanism too, too, too fondly. Um, this kind of relates to a lot of things that have been said, really, about the future of the university and um, constructing knowledge. Um, but something about, you know, the, the universities persisting with disciplines, and these disciplines, as we know, so many of them trace their origins back to colonialism. And, you know, things like anthropology, obviously archaeology, um, but also geography, um, sociology, and, 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 and you know, psychology as well. In fact, I mean, Fanon yeah. was a psych- was a psychiatrist. And I'm just wondering. Um, and then recently, the the new benchmark statements by QA, QAA have all many of these subjects now have a, um, a decolonizing um, statement. They, 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 I mean, they, they, they're committing themselves to sort of decolonizing their, their academic subject. And I'm wondering, actually, are, are, by remaining within these disciplines, that actually we're not going to be able to fully escape. Um, or we're not. We're, we're going to slow down that process because I'm thinking about those really arbitrary distinctions between psychology and sociology. Um, the idea that you can study psychology without being at the same time studying society is yeah, yeah, is, yeah, is, yeah. is fundamental to the issue, and, and also particularly. I mean, there was, there was a lot of kickback from subjects like, like, like maths, yeah, yeah. mathematics, um, saying, you know, what's what's colorism got to do with maths? This is this is uh-huh. a, this is this is this is pure. This this is this is just abstract thinking. Um, mm-hmm. But as you mentioned there, I mean, things like maths and stats go to the heart of AI and yeah. algorithms. And and I was recently playing because everyone's panicking about a chat GPT at the moment. I was playing around with some of these um, text to image generators mm. so basically you can type a sentence and this this AI will create a picture for you of your sentence yeah, yeah. and and I was just shocked I shouldn't have been shocked but I was because as soon as I typed I typed in an example um, of man and woman and every instance it was a white male or a white yeah, female yeah, yeah. there was not even a there was no there wasn't even a selection yeah, yeah. Um, and what and obviously on top of that and this is why I mean intersectionality because it was not say it wasn't just a white man it was a young white man it was a young white man who was clearly aesthetically aesthetically the norm um you, you know so every, who didn't wear glasses so a whole range it wasn't he was he was so a whole range of other ways so and so mm-hmm. in that sense I think I am yeah, I, I don't think we can yeah. treat decolonization simply as as a metaphor, but I think we should always also acknowledge that that the intersectional aspect of it, because I yeah. think and I think that's something that comes across when you look at the yeah. decolon, decolon, decolonization, decoloniality that comes from the sort of um, theorists in um, mm-hmm. Latin America always stress, you, you know, it, it's 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 the decolonization, the gender is inseparable from. Yeah, yeah, from the deep, the, the coloniality of power. Yeah. Um, but, but so there were just some thoughts about, you know, whether so to sum up, do you think academic disciplines themselves in their present forms may may well be an obstacle? Uh, yeah, in, well, in pushing if, you, forward? If, you, if you recall the work of de Souza Santos, he talks about ecologies of knowledge. Yeah. That what we need to do is try to build ecology. And that links a bit like with that post human question. Um, Foucault in his archaeology of knowledge that really can help us to understand where these disciplinary boundaries can come from. And, 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 and you know, he, he says they come from power control, discipline. Uh, and, and so it's interesting how disciplinary boundaries and discipline kind of overlap, doesn't it? These, these were they was they were deployed uh, because in a sense, if you think about, say, science, you know, it was called natural philosophy before it kind of becomes then codified and commodified and you know, becomes instrumental in the kind of political projects. Yeah, um, you know, criminology, for example, would be another one. So, so I think I think the disciplining of knowledge maybe helps us to understand how coloniality works and capitalism. The question is, where do we go from here? And I think you know, certainly, interdisciplinarity is the way we've got to go forward. And um, we also, Max Weber said something. I mean, he wrote an essay called "The Great Disenchantment." Yeah. So he was heavily critical of Hegel. He was heavily critical of the European Enlightenment philosophers who, who were seemingly destroying everything that came before them, that somehow all that mattered was the Hegelian dialectic and where we'd got to now. So I think we need to somehow, I, I think dialectics is important because we're engaged in the dialectic, but I think we need to think about it in ways that's not 
linear. Now that might be a contradiction because you know what what is dialect if it isn't a linear kind of. So I think we need to find some ways of thinking about knowledge creation that's not this kind of linear idea, and it's kind of complementary. And I'm I'm not sure how to get there because we've all been trained in this kind of way of thinking. Yeah. Um. But no, no, I think you're right. I think um, we need to break out of these discipline boundaries. You know, I, that's why I call myself an academic activist. You know, you know, simple as that. Yeah, you, you, you're silent at the time. Yeah, I think that point, if I could just come back very briefly, I don't want to hog the conversation, but I think mm -hmm. there's a really good example. You mentioned Hegel. And if you look at Hegel from a, as a philosopher and you abstract it from history, then you get this sort of, you know, this notion of dialectic as something that has nothing to do with our real world. Um, yeah. However, if you look at this, if, there's a really, I forget the name of the study, there's a really, really good study of Hegel within his time, so a historical take on Hegel and his dialectic. And actually, you mentioned Haiti, San Domingo. Yeah. Hegel was actually very much inspired by the Haitian Revolution. It was a slave revolt. So the whole master dialectic was based upon the slave revolt. So it wasn't something yeah. that was, it wasn't conceived abstract. It was actually something that emerged within the historical context. And and by understanding the historical yeah. context, it makes it make it so another, another way of approaching Hegel and approaching yeah. history. And it's really interesting because the author of this particular text put that very proposition towards to, to a to a um, philosopher and said, Will this and persuaded the philosopher of her thesis. And the philosopher said, well, this all may well be true, but it won't alter the way I teach philosophy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think so, you're right. But Hegel also gives us some of those theories of race and feeds into social biology and all kinds of stuff. But he, he said he was horrified when he looked at the Haitian revolution. He looked at the brutality of the slave owners and the colonialists. He thought, if these people are advanced Europeans, then I've got something wrong here. So he did. He, there was a com these people are dealing with the contradictions of their times, and I think you know we need to understand that, just like we are. Yeah, that's great. We, uh, we could uh, we'll go on for now. Drop me a line, Simon. Yeah. Right. Who else is there? Is any more? Anybody have, want to jump in? And if we don't have any more questions in the chat that I can see, unfortunately, um, apologies if I've missed anyone. But does anybody want to um, raise their hand and put their camera on? If not, we can finish the session early. We do have 15 more minutes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, um, yeah, Suzanne talks about Deleuze and Guattari's and Rhizome. I think that's an interesting, I know I've got, I've just had a PhD student who's been using that in looking at decolonizing sports. There's some interesting stuff there. Coming back to the Haitian Revolution, maybe I think we do need to uh, look at that because in some senses, as Simon was saying, if you look at, um, uh, what happened there, you know, and the and, and the central character, who's um uh, who's a mulattoized mixed race. Yeah, he's he becomes an MP in the French Parliament. He he is um he's inspired Toussaint Louverture. He's inspired by the French Revolution. You know, and and liberty, equality, and fraternity, and 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 in some senses, it's what I was saying. You know, with Gil Gilroy's conversation. The, the, the way to dismantle the master's house is to use the man, martyrs own claims for itself. And that's what the Haitian revolutionaries did. They said, you're talking about human freedom and liberty and things, yeah? Well, we're now going to put it into practice, yeah? So I think that, I think it is quite interesting. And and we can't deny the fact that Marxist revolutionary kind of communism inspired a lot of revolutionary movements and, you know, anti-colonial movements. And that, not to say that those ideas themselves, you know, were perfect and that, you know, in a sense, they've collapsed under their own contradictions, yeah? But but we do need to find some ways to uh, engage politically that can transcend. Otherwise, we fall into a politics of identity. Otherwise, we we we, we succumb to nationalisms and things like that, which are equally problematic. So we do need to be able to ground some of the our work in in politics, even if it's in the kind of um, non-political party politics. Yeah, we need to say what is the political project behind this? Because if we reduce decolonization to a political project. Then you know if it doesn't succeed, then don't you know don't be surprised. Yeah, um, Harshad has put his hand up. Yeah. Hi, hi, good, and thanks so much for that really, really rich, uh, thought-provoking paper. And good to meet you. And hi, Melanie, and everyone else. Really quick question. Sorry, it's come right at the end. It's because your paper is so full of so much richness. I can't th just thinking through all the different <laughs> things, and I'd love to talk to you more. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, it, it just seems to me it's so frustrating. First of all, it's so wonderful in these spaces that we all get together and we can share ideas. 
But I find what's really frustrating is that at the senior leadership levels of universities, you've got a funda there's a fundamental disjuncture, um, a non-meeting of minds, thoughts, intentions and actions, because at senior leadership and a lot of other levels, they're not aware of the richness of the ideas that, for example, you've spoken about and so many of us share. And so the decision making policies, processes and procedures that go into driving all of our lives and students' lives, mm -hmm. none of them are actually informed by the sheer richness of this last 300 years of work that's been going on. Yeah. And so for me, that that's a there's a fundamental break in how we're going to do this project of you know, whether it's a decolonizing or whether it's anti-colonialism or social justice. And the second kind of real problem I was wondering about your thoughts on this is the, the internal contradictions in social science itself, because it just seems to me that it's not just an institutional appropriation of decolonialities and decolonizing, but actually the internal social scientific appropriation, because the publishing model itself yeah. has taken this thing and run with it and it's created these boundaries where so many people doing the work on the ground are actually being marginalised yeah, and yeah. excluded from the work. So I was wondering if you had thoughts on, yeah, on, on you that. You are, Kevil. I mean, what happens is there's a kind of privileging of whiteness, which is that if whiteness shows some kind of positive response to these questions of anti-racism, decoloniality, then it gets awarded and rewarded so much more than those people who have been living it. And I think that's to do with a, a, a deep insecurity to hand over power to non-white people, or only hand over power conditionally, uh, hand over power in ways that you can pull it back from that any moment. That's why I think as you advance up in, 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 the, in, in the kind of echelons of higher education as a non-white, as a kind of black brown person, life is always precarious. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's frightening and dangerous and burnout there. And, you know, I've written about that in terms of you know, black, black academics and their experiences. So I, I, I suppose that, and that just further shows that the logics of the institution haven't changed, yeah? Now, can these leaders make a difference? I mean, any, anybody can make a difference uh, within their own sphere of influence, yeah? I think we all try to, that's kind of where we left. So we all form our little kind of groups and we, a bit like this space here. But in terms of that historical change, I think something fundamental needs to shift. And, and again, I'm not gonna be pompous enough to say what that is because that in itself defeats the kind of critique which is you can't change things from above you have to change things from below yeah where do we go from that? i think we need to reconceive the university i mean at the moment that i don't i don't know which university you are attached but you know i used to be attached to Coventry. it's an imperial institution and i'm, and I'm happy for the senior management of Coventry to come and challenge and i used to challenge the vice chancellor every year when he used to give his talk to the point where he got fed up of me putting my hand up uh but that's what they're doing You've got all these white people traveling around Egypt, around Africa, having pictures and you know, and saying we're spreading enlightenment to all these places. It's disgusting. And and in fact, some of these institutions, they'd be bankrupt if it wasn't for international students' fees. Yet their response to international students is always timid in terms of their needs. So I don't know. I mean, am I I'm am, am I being pessimistic? I'm just being realistic, not pessimistic, you know. Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree. I think we need a we need a fundamental rethinking from the ground up, and I think when the university and the people who work in it start to reflect this wider pluralistic vision of what the possibilities and the horizons of knowledge look yeah. like and the horizons of being look like, then we start to get there. But Absolutely. I think you know I always go I always go back to Charles Mills's work on the racial contracts and these these kind of this willful ignorance. There, there seems to be a very powerful, willful, willful ignorance located in structural whiteness that mm. just isn't shifting right now. And I think that's what's causing so much trauma and harm. So and of thank course, you. the social contract and the racial contract, you know, it, it, you know, it, it's a, it's an, it's it goes back many years and it's the base, the fulcrum on which you, European power is justified. And it's justified on the basis that those people who are superior intellectually they're the ones that have more should have more power because they're the ones that can fulfill a social contract yeah and that's why these categories these kind of hierarchies of intelligence were used and deployed to deny non-white people uh, access to power because and women because they couldn't fulfill the social contract yeah so we have to get rid of this notion of rationality 
and the human subject as well. That's one of the ontological kind of barriers that we have. Uh, you know, we either say we're all rational, intelligent beings or none of us are. You know, I don't think you can have a hierarchy of intelligence. And and I've been talking about being against intelligence. Universities should be against intelligence, which again is sounds like an oxymoron. But intelligence is a destructive idea. In fact, AI is going to tell us how destructive intelligence is. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks Cheers. for that, Kevin Harshad. One last question before we close off, and this is, I guess, open to anyone who is in this uh, session from Sheila. Can we hear from any universities who are making some progress in these areas? Is there any hope that we can take from others? Sorry, if you, repeat that if you know anyone, if you hmm? know any, if you know of anything that's taking place or any progress, but also Look, to anyone I mean, else. There's loads of stuff taking place, I, and and, and <laughs> I don't want to belittle the work that lots of colleagues are doing in their own spaces. Yeah, we need to keep doing that. Maybe that's the only game in town. All I'm saying is that. Uh, um, be realistic about that, because if you're realistic, then then you might last the course. If you're not, then you might be hugely disappointed at some point. Yeah, and we don't want we don't want that. We want people to survive these violent institutions. Uh, and you know, the more in in those spaces, the more people are thinking about these questions, the more we can alleviate. You know, that's why Martin and Harney didn't say that. You know, we should necessarily destroy the university. He says, whilst it's there, we, we need to, I think they use the word steal, we need to steal the resources from it and redistribute them, you know? And so, you know, as long as you've got that kind of commitment to that kind of model, you know, sense of a bigger project, I think you're all right. I think it's where we, where we, where we become over enthusiastic about these performative kind of um, interventions that we might then get disappointed when people say, well, actually nothing much changed, yeah? So I don't know if I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, that's a low note, but you know, I mean, we've, we've got to survive. Well, that's the key thing, you know? Um, and you know, if we survive, that's that's half the battle won. But sadly, a lot of, you know, a lot of people fall by the wayside. Um, but, uh, you know, the fact that we've got this series and itself, I think is important. Although just mark my word, I think the government will be seeking to close off a lot of this work. I think that you know there's kind of quite a bigger backlash, anti-what backlash, uh, civil liberties, kind of libertarian backlash. So I think we need to keep that space open, and it'll become even more difficult. I think. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we've got a hand up. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask if I could read out my poem to end your session, Gurnam. It's silent. Please, I, I want somebody to lift us a bit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, silent. I don't know if it'll do that, but. You know, let's let's um, can I read it out? Would that be OK? Yes. Uh, yeah, Melanie. Yeah. Is that OK? OK. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's called No End and No Beginning Race Equity in Higher Education. Inside the ivory tower and the fortress of white walls, the institutions, oppression, discrimination and all microaggressions, unfair treatment, poor retention and more. No promotion or progression, poor degree outcomes for sure. Hearing people's stories and sharing their pain, often I feel helpless, they've told me all in vain. Such a heavy burden, the turmoil and the tears. The same stories continue for oh so many years. What do I say and how shall I respond? An overflowing vessel, how long can this go on? I want to help them all, I genuinely do. Be there to support, a hug and listen to. We have to share your stories. We have to change the system. We have to listen hard and learn from people's wisdom. We can't remain as faces at the bottom of the well. We have to help each other, as said by Derek Bell. Community of hope, we have to teach with love. As Bell Hooks already told us, she looks down from up above. So don't be silent, sit back or think it's not your job. That dismissal and denial upholds the right wing mob. Let's come together, our community, building and belonging. Listen and take action. Stop that trauma from prolonging. To become a better person means we have to help each other, looking out for one another as a sister or a brother. I can't give up the fight nor the struggle of my family. I must be brave. I must be bold and battle on valiantly.
Seeing siblings happy builds up my strength and passion. Worthwhile is all my pain, my time I'll never ration. My heart is full of love, compassion and true care. My students are my children, with them my heart I share. With colleagues and my peers, I stand in solidarity. Long lasting bonds we build and comfort in familiarity. Old stories and new tales, no end and no beginning. I will soldier on despite the ever stinging. Race, race equity and EDI work, I do it all wholehearted, even though I often feel my voice is not regarded. Despite all this, I work so hard and I will never stop. I see how people take the credit and my name is dropped. My ideas and creativity are growing and keep flowing. I want to share it all and good outcomes keep me going. To nurture hearts with generosity, compassion and give my time. It's not an easy journey, but you must maintain the climb. Where is humanity? Accomplices, stand up, please. Racism is an illness and spreads like a disease. I'm not referring to the overt forms of harm, but it's all those subtleties that might not raise alarm. In a university, by default, you think you are fair just because you're liberal, so now you're not aware. Surrounded by the legacy of our colonial past, the tortured impact on us, but have you ever asked? And how about our people who do not have a voice? Whilst you sit back in privilege, they have no other choice. It's not another saviour that's needed to put it right, but together in solidarity, we can put up a fight. Fragility, defensiveness, or denial, there's no place. Accountability in action, you now must show your face. Kindness and positivity, a smile for us each day. I'm forever optimistic and it's the only way. That's wonderful, yeah, that's great. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. What a um, way to end. Yeah, wonderful way to end the session. Thank you all for coming and particularly again. And thank you so much thank for you. sharing with us today. Um, and everyone have a great evening and take care.